vida mi gente much love and respect thanks for tuning in once again really appreciate that today we're gonna just quickly read something i got a lot of new people guys and we're trying to track a lot of the younger audience and people who like quick videos so we want to show these little excerpts in these historical books so that they don't miss out on the previous information in older longer videos that i got we're going to quickly read from the 19th annual report of the Bureau of American Ethnology to the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, 1897-98 to by J.W. Powell, Director, okay? Director of the Bureau of American Ethnology. This is part one of two parts of this 19th annual report it's from 1900. We belly flop to page 232 going to start off in this paragraph in the bottom it says here the question of the origin of myths is one which affords abundant opportunity for ingenious theories in the absence of any possibility of proof those of the Cherokee are too far broken down ever to be woven together again into any long connected origin legend such as we find with some tribes Although a few still exhibit a certain sequence which indicates that they once formed component parts of a cycle, from the prominence of the rabbit in the animal stories, as well as in those found among the southern Negroes, an effort has been made to establish for them a Negro origin. Regardless of the fact that the rabbit, the great white rabbit, is the hero god, trickster, and wonder worker of all the tribes east of the Mississippi from Hudson Bay to the Gulf. So he's saying, hold up, it ain't a so-called Negro origin because, you know, that's supposed to mean, oh, they got it from Africa, right? So this author right here in the annual report is saying, look, they have myths. These Southern Negroes have American indigenous folklore and myths in their own folklore and myths. What a coincidence. In European folklore, also the rabbit is regarded as something uncanny and half supernatural. And even in far off Korea, he is the central figure in the animal myths. Just why this should be so is a question that may be left to the theorists to decide. Among the Algonquin tribes, the name Wabos, all right, Wabos, seems to have been confounded with that of the Don Waban so that the great white rabbit is really the incarnation of the eastern dawn that brings light and life and drives away the dark shadows which have held the world in chains. The animal itself seems to be regarded by the Indians as the fitting type of defenseless weakness protected and made safe by constantly alert vigilance. And with a disposition, moreover, for turning up at unexpected moments, the same characteristics would appeal as strongly to the primitive mind of the Negro. All right, listen to this. The same characteristics happen to be in the primitive mind. Gosh, the hijack. They have the same stories. The very expression which Harris puts into the mouth of Uncle Remus. In them days, Br'er Rabbit 
and his family was at the head of or their gang when any racket was in hand was paraphrased in the Cherokee language by Suyeta in introducing his first rabbit story. And you guys see there in the language of the Cherokee, the rabbit was the leader of them all in mischief. All right. It's the same story. The expression struck the author so forcibly that the words were recorded as spoken. All right. So they're letting you know something here, guys. Even though they're seeing it in a whole different way. But let's read it. Listen to this part right here, guys. In regard to the contact between the two races, but where such stories could be borrowed from one by the other. So they're talking about the so-called Negro race and the so-called Native American race, right? So we got to dodge the hijack big time because there is no separation many times. Indians were classified as so-called Negroes. And so-called Negroes were... American Indians. So they're trying to explain why they're trying to explain why they would have all these so-called Native American myths and folklores in their own folklores. Not understanding that that's their own oral history too. But either way, they're going to let you know how Indians were being enslaved with so-called Negroes or another person of color. It could be a black European. It could be other Indians from other parts of America. It could be many things. So it says here, it is not commonly known that in all the southern colonies, Indian slaves were bought and sold and kept in servitude and worked in the fields side by side with Negroes up to the time of the revolution, all the way up to 1776. Come on. Indian slaves being bought and sold, right? We already broke this down. Who were they really enslaving? Not to go back to the Spanish period when such things were the order of the day, all right? So when the Spanish were here in the Southeast, what do you think they were doing? It was the order of the day. They were enslaving American Indians, not Africans. We find the Cherokee as early as 1693 complaining that their people were being kidnapped by slave hunters. Hundreds of captured Tuscarora and nearly the whole tribe of the Appalachian were distributed as slaves among the Carolina colonists, the Appalachian nations, okay? As slaves were in North Carolina. It wasn't Africans they were sending there. It was the Appalachian in the early part of the 18th century. That's the 1700s. While the Natchez and others shared a similar fate in Louisiana, what happened to the Natchez? Remember, they got sent to Haiti, to the Caribbean, many of them. And as late, at least as 1776, Cherokee prisoners of war were still sold to the highest bidder for the same purpose. At some time, it was charged against the governor of South Carolina that he was provoking a general Indian war by his encouragement of slave hunts. Furthermore, as the coast tribes dwindled, they were compelled to associate and intermarry with the Negroes. Uh-oh, dodge the hijack. Many of these tribes or tribal people are so-called Negroes. And look how they try to explain this. They say until they finally lost their identity, they disappeared, the Indians went extinct. And were classed with that race. So they became Negroes, huh? The Indians. Copper colored tribes. So that a considerable proportion of the blood of the Southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian. Again, guys, listen up. So that a considerable proportion of the blood of the Southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian. All right. So how did we get to this? Because... They were trying to explain why so-called Negroes would know American indigenous folklore and mythology, oral traditions. They had to tell you the truth. Indians were being enslaved. And these are the same people. They're just trying to explain it in a different way here. So you, you got to dodge the hijack. They're saying they lost their identity and were classed with the so-called Negroes, so they became the Negroes. Oh, well, that's what we've been saying the whole time. 
Yes, American indigenous people, millions of them were reclassified as paper genocide. So again, a considerable proportion of the blood of the Southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian. Never forget that. Know that. The same self-hate is called genealogy and knowing who you are. Now, before we go away from this book, I want to show you guys something. Now, I'm in Pinterest right here. And you guys know how there's a lot of pictures here, images of black Europeans and so-called black Indians, uh, just like this one right here to the right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on it. This is the image right here. And the image says it's Walini, a Cherokee woman, a huh? Cherokee woman. As you guys can see, a dark complexion person. Somebody's asking, what book is this? And, you know, Unfortunately, in Pinterest, this happens all the time. Nobody ever actually puts the source. But you know me, guys, I always look for everything. And returning to the 19th annual report of the Bureau of American Ethnology to the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, I go to page 379, and here she is right here. All right, let me back up so you guys can see. Walini, a Cherokee woman. All right, it's the same book from where we just read. So Swarthy, Copper Colored Tribes of America. Page 273, this is Ayasta, who is being called the Cherokee Indian as well, as you guys can see. What I wanted to show you is that I actually had an image of somebody who is called Ayasta's daughter. And I want to show that to you guys right now. This is the image I was talking about right here. It says here on the top, um, Cherokee. Ayasta's daughter, 1888. All right, Ayasta's daughter right here. There you go. So I'm not sure if that's the same Ayasta that we just saw, but most likely it is. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this little uh, reading, this little excerpt right here from the 19th Annual Report of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Again, a considerable proportion of the blood of the Southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian, unquestionably Indian. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, again, guys, I'm going to leave off with a bonus uh, little video here in case you haven't seen it before in regards to the Indians they encountered in the state of New York. Enjoy. Hey, uh... Another one, another one, another one, 
ก็ว่า I'm gonna read real quick from this book. Travels through the states of North America and the provinces of Upper and Lower Canada during the years 1795, 1796, and 1797 by Isaac Welt Jr. and this was written in 1799. We go to page 375 of this book, and we got letter 35 or chapter 35. Observations on the Indians. A brief account of the person's manners, character, qualifications, mental and corporeal of the Indians, interspersed with anecdotes. What I shall first take notice of in the persons of the Indians is the color of their skins, which in fact constitutes the most striking distinction between their persons and ours. In general, their skin is of a copper. Cass again, copper cast, right? Copper colored tribes of America, copper. There is dark copper, right? And there's light copper. But a most wonderful difference of color is observable amongst them. All right? So, like I just said, many shades of that copper, even amongst the Indians. So there's dark complexion ones, and there's lighter skin ones. Some in whose veins there is no reason to think that any other than Indian blood flows, not having darker complexions than natives of the south of France or of Spain, all right? And those are pretty dark people right there. While others, on the contrary, are nearly as black as Negroes. Say what? As what? As black as Negroes. They're talking about American Indians here in Lower Canada, Upper North America. Most likely Iroquois or Algonquin speaking tribes they're what again they're as black as negroes yeah i'm not the one saying it i'm not trying to make anybody so-called negro this is history these are primary sources these are people who actually was there living at that time telling you they wrote this in the 1700s many persons and particularly some of the most respectable of the french missionaries whose long residence amongst the indians ought to have made them competent judges of the matter have been of opinion that their natural color does not vary from ours and that the darkness of their complexion arises wholly from their anointing themselves so frequently with unctuous substances, from their exposing themselves to so much to the smoke of wood fires and to the burning rays of the sun. So they're trying to explain why they're so dark, you know. But although it is certain that they think a dark complexion very becoming, so they're saying that the Indians enjoy and they love their dark complexion, that they take great pains from their earliest age to acquire such an one, and that many of them do, in process of time, contrive to vary the original color very considerably. Although it is certain likewise, that when first born the color differs but little from ours, yet it appears evident to me that the greater part of them are indebted for their different hues to nature alone, all right, their different hues of copper, copper colored tribes of America, I have been induced to form this opinion from the following consideration, namely, that those children which are born of parents of a dark color are almost universally of the same dark cast as those from whom they sprang. Nekik, that is, the little otter, an Ottawa chief of great notoriety, whose village is on Detroit River, and with whom we have become intimately acquainted Listen to what they're going to say. Has a complexion that differs but little from that of an African. Nekik, the little otter, the Ottawa chief. The Ottawa chief has what complexion that differs little from that of an African, just like an African. And his little boys, who are the very image of the father, are just as black as himself. And his Indian children as well are what? So-called Negroes too. You guys hearing this primary source with regard to Indian children being white on their first coming into the world, it ought by no means to be concluded from thence that they would remain so if their mothers did not bedaw them with grease, herbs, and it is well known that Negro children are not perfectly black when born, nor indeed for many months afterwards, but that they acquire the jetty hue gradually on being exposed to the air and sun just as in the vegetable world the tender blade on first peeping above ground turns from white 
to a pale greenish color and afterwards to a deeper green all right so that's any hijacks what they're trying to theorize they're not talking about somebody being born pale skin like a white person pale skin and then becoming a so-called negro we know that you know as babies tend to be uh, born even in the so-called black uh, community uh, lighter when they're born and then they get darker as they you know the days go by or the months or the years that's natural that's kind of what they're telling you right here but then again but again they're telling you that their skins do not differ from that of an african and that his kids were just as black as him so-called black right though i remarked to you in a former letter that the Mississaugians, who live about Lake Ontario, were of a much darker cast, much darker. They even darker the Mississaugans. That's from Mississauga, Canada. Okay, the Mississaugis were of much darker cast than any other tribe of Indians I met with. Yet I do not think that the different shades of complexion observable amongst the Indians are so much confined to particular tribes as to particular families, or even amongst the Mississaugians. I saw several men that were comparatively of a very light color. Judging of the Creeks, Cherokees, and other Southern Indians, from what I have seen of them at Philadelphia and at other towns in the States, whither they often come in large parties, led either by business or curiosity, it appears to me that their skin has a redder tinge, all right, a redder tinge and more warmth of coloring in it. If I may use the expression, than that of the Indians in the neighborhood of the lakes. It appears to me also that there is less difference of color amongst them than amongst those last mentioned. All right, so he didn't say they were lighter. He said they were just a little redder. They're still dark, but more reddish dark, right? Amongst the female Indians also in general, there is a much greater sameness of color than amongst the men. I do not recollect to have seen any of a deeper complexion than what might be termed a dirty copper color dirty copper color the women and they're all kind of like the same he's saying right the Indian so we continue to another area very close to uh lake erie another part of the great lakes it says here original narratives of early american history reproduced under the auspices of the american historical association general editor j franklin jameson phd lld Director of the Department of Historical Research in the Carnegie Institute of Washington, says here narratives of New Netherlands, 1609-1664, all right? Primary sources. Chapter 10 of this book, real quick, it gets into the story of Hendrik Hudson. Yes, the person who Hudson Bay is named after. It says here, who first discovered this river and all that have since visited it, expressed their admiration of the noble trees growing there. He himself describes to us the manners and appearance of the people that he found dwelling immediately within this bay in the following terms, all right? Primary source from Mr. Hudson himself, the guy they named Hudson Bay after. What does he say right away? It says, when I came on shore, what happened? Who did he see right away? The Swarthy natives. Swarthy. Swarthy means so-called black, dark skin. The Swarthy natives. That's who met him there in Hudson Bay, right? The Swarthy natives all stood and sang in their fashion. They were singing too. For their clothing consists of skins of foxes and other animals, which they dress and make the garments from skins of various sorts. Their food is Turkish wheat. All right, now remember, go back to my corn videos, the original Turkish wheat is corn. Turkish wheat, it has that name Turkish wheat because before Columbus brought it over to Europe, corn was already in the ancient world over there. It came in through Asia, through Turkey. So a lot of the time it would be called Turkish wheat because they were bringing it over to Europe. But it was maize, which they cook by bacon, and it is excellent eating. They soon came on board one after another in their canoes, which are made of a single piece of wood. Their weapons are bows and arrows pointed with sharp stones, which they fastened with hard resin. They had no houses, but slept under the blue heavens, some on mats or bulrushes interwoven, and some on the leaves of trees. They always carry with them all their goods, as well as their food and green tobacco, which is strong and good for use. They appear to be a friendly people, but are much inclined to steal, and are adroit in carrying away whatever they take a fancy to. 
Uh, I saw he's complaining about the Swarti natives. Hey, well, he shouldn't be there, right, in their land. <laughs> Swarti. Hey, 